got some sweet potato on the on the go, so while that cooks, I'm gonna do a wrap up of the live Everesting, give you some tips, things that I learned that can maybe help you succeed if you're looking to do an Everesting as well. And the first thing I would say is why? Why bother climbing the height of Everest on your bike? I would recommend to everybody that they do something like this, an Everesting. It doesn't have to be on the bike, but just some kind of physical challenge that pushes them to their limit, mentally and physically. There's no, there's no other way to learn what you'll learn about yourself. You'll get so much value out of it that you never thought you would. You'll, <laughs> you'll learn so much about yourself that you couldn't learn about yourself any other way, and you, unless you go through something like this, and you'll come out the other side a better person for it. You're having learned so much more about yourself that you just don't get, you don't get challenged in the same way in, in everyday modern life. And so you have to do something insane like this, <laughs> like an Everest thing. So the next thing I would say is don't make it harder than it needs to be. So I did a live Everest thing where I broadcast it to the world on Boxing Day. So two things there that you don't need to do. Make sure that you do it when you have, where you have enough daylight. So doing it on Boxing Day in the dead of winter, um, where you only have, I think there's only like 12 hours of daylight, and it's going to take you at least 10, 12, 14 hours at least to complete an Everesting. So you want to do it in summer when the temperature is, <laughs> is, is higher than freezing like it was for me. So don't do it in freezing temperatures in the dead of winter. Definitely do it in summer. So don't make it harder than it needs to be. Do it when the weather is good. Don't do it in the rain. That's another thing. Too many of my challenges that I've done, like riding from Yorkshire to London, rain has been the thing that's made it so much more difficult than it, than it needed to be. So good weather, uh, enough daylight, and just don't make, just don't add, add things other than you on your bike and a single hill up and down until you reach the height of Everest. Just keep it simple, keep it as simple as that. Uh, and the next thing, find a hill that suits you. So you're gonna be going up and down this hill a lot <laughs> and you don't want, you, you want it to be a hill that is right for you. So I picked the hill that I Everested on because it was my home. It was my home turf. It was where I grew up in, in St. Albans. And it was, it was something that was going to mean a lot to me. So the hill that you pick, if it has some kind of significance to you, then it's going to make it all the, all the more satisfying and, and all the more engaging for you to Everest it. So pick a hill that suits you, that has some kind of significance to you. You also wanna pick a practical hill that is gonna have enough elevation on it for you to feel like you're getting somewhere every time you do a repetition of it. And that also doesn't have too many speed bumps on it, that doesn't undulate too much. You wanna do, you wanna do, you wanna scout out, do some recce rides to find hills that are gonna be suitable. If you can, you wanna pick a hill that has a continuous gradient on it not too many obstacles and not too much traffic, that would be the perfect Everesting hill. And something that also has enough elevation on it so that each time you do a repetition of it, it feels like you're getting somewhere. Waverley Road that I did my Everesting on, that had just about enough <laughs> elevation each repetition. The good things about Waverley Road were that it had a roundabout at the bottom and a turning at the top. <clears throat> so you also want to have somewhere that you can turn around at both ends because you don't want to have, you don't want to be turning around in the middle of the road into oncoming traffic. <laughs> That's also not a good idea. The next thing is to pace yourself. Don't go, don't go hard in the beginning, don't go hard in the middle, don't go hard at the end. <laughs> Just keep, you want to keep a steady, continuous pace throughout the entire ride. You want to find, you want, if you've got a power meter, it's going to help because you're going to be able to find the exact kind of wattage that it's going to take for you to climb each repetition of the hill. A repetition of this hill takes me two minutes to do at this certain wattage or at this certain speed. You're going to have to extrapolate that data out across 12 hours, out across at least 12 hours. So you're going to have to, from there, you're going to be able to work out the kind of, you know, what is your drop off going to be? How, how, if you start at the beginning at this pace, 
then what kind of pace are you going to be doing 12 hours later? Yeah, I can't, I can't stress, I can't stress enough how how difficult it's going to be at certain points where you just feel like you've got nothing left in the tank, and you want to avoid that feeling as as much as possible. You always want to feel like you can do one more repetition because one more repetition is all you need to do. When you're in the moment doing a challenge like the, like an Everesting, you always want to be in the moment. And as long as you've got one more repetition left in you, that's all you need to do. So the next thing after pacing would be to keep a good, consistent cadence. Along with pace, paden, cadence, pacing and cadence are going to go hand in hand because if you're grinding your way up your hill because you've got improper gearing or you've not got the right technique, then by like halfway through the cartilage in your knees is going to be fucked <laughs> and you, your joints are going to be fucked and your muscles are going to be fucked and you're just your entire system is going to be fucked and you're you're going to be fucked <laughs> your everest thing is fucked i think let me look up my strava so my average cadence for the hill was 89 which is almost spinning <laughs> it's one rep it's one rep per minute what, of what I consider spinning. Gearing, I, sh I, I should have had just, I think if I had one more, one more gear on my rear cassette, then I would have been, I would have been able to keep a much higher cadence than that. So ideally, I would have liked to have kept an average cadence of 100, and that will have just been down to my gearing. If I'd have had a 30, a 50-34, which I had on the front, and an 11-36 on the back, then that would have been enough for me to have kept a cadence of 100, and I think that would have made the Everest thing a lot easier. So if you can, this was a, so also, it depends on the hill as well. So this was a 7% gradient hill. So a 7% gradient hill with a 11-36 on the back, that would have been enough for me to keep a cadence of 100. So next time I would definitely have an 11.36 on the back because cadence is so important. It was so much easier for me in the beginning of the Everesting when I was keeping a higher cadence because my cadence was definitely higher in the beginning but as I started to fatigue, the 11.32 just wasn't quite enough for me to keep my cadence up enough, to keep my cadence up above 90 which meant that I fatigued a lot quicker than I needed to. So an 11.36 would have been ideal for an average gradient hill of 7%. But yeah, pick your gearing wisely. Don't go into this thinking that you're gonna, you're just gonna power your way through, because I can tell you, it's gonna get harder than you could ever imagine <laughs> when you get deep into an Everesting. So the last tip I'll give is on fuel, and I'm looking here on my Strava, and it's telling me I burnt 10,735 calories, and that should be a pretty accurate measurement of how many calories I burnt because I have a power meter. So my recommendation for fuel is sugar water. You want as much sugar water as you can store at your base camp as possible, because you're gonna need it. You're gonna need that sugar water. You're gonna underestimate quite how much, how many calories you're gonna burn, and you're gonna need sugar water. As much as I would love to have done this on whole food alone, there's just no way. There's no way you're going to be able to do epic shit like this. There's no way you can burn 10,735 calories and have it all come from whole food. Because there's going to be too much lag in between you eating your dates and your body having replenished its glycogen stores. Some kind of sugar water, you're going to need it because otherwise you've already failed. But try it for yourself. Try an Everesting on low carb, or even try an Everesting on whole food alone, and then try an Everesting with the addition of sugar water. And tell me which Everesting was easier, because I know what it feels like to bonk on an Everesting. And I know what it feels like that as soon as I've drank sugar water, that you feel like a new person and you feel like you can conquer how, however much of Everest you've got left to go. So they're my tips on Everesting, what I learnt, what I would do next time. I would recommend that anybody, everybody, try something like an Everesting where they push themselves to their limits because what you're gonna learn about yourself, you can't learn any other way and modern life just isn't geared up to teach you these things that you're gonna learn from doing something like this. My sweet potato will have gotten cold by now but 
Fuck it, pleased to be talking to you. Thanks for listening, thanks for watching. Eat plants, don't eat cold sweet potato, and I will see you in the next one.